So Lucas Gilman is a well-known uh, action photographer. Uh, he covers extreme sports, and uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a difficult task to do photographically, Lucas tackles it. I mean, look at the guy, look at those guns on him. He's ready to take over, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Lucas Gilman. Thank you very much, David. Can you hear me in the back? Um, I live in California and we have the worst allergy season on record. So I brought my allergies to uh, New York. I figured that the easiest way to give you guys an idea of the kind of things that I shoot would be to do a brief video that kind of shows you what my office looks like. So without further ado. So that's the office. What do you think? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, as I said, I, I've been a Nikon shooter my entire career. But really it starts out with a passion. And we're all here in this room because we enjoy taking photos. And whatever you use to capture those images, we all have this common bond. It's like a language that we speak. Uh, I was always the kid that liked to be the one on the vacation to take the family photos. I never really thought it would be a career. So I just went out and started taking photos. I started at the University of Colorado, and I went to be a writer, actually. Figured out really quickly that was way too much work, so I decided photography might be something. Um, and really, I am known as an action photographer, but, but I really enjoy all types of photography. I love landscapes, I love slow shutter speeds. I just like to have a camera in my hands at all points. Um, I travel all over the world doing uh, work for different clients, but again, my bread and butter is action photography. And hopefully if you walk away with one thing today, you'll be able to go out and shoot not only action photography, but some you know, different types of photography as well. Uh, I've covered two of the fronts many times over the years. One of my favorite events, absolutely amazing, uh, going through France covering these things. Covered the Kentucky Derby many, many years in a row. Uh, this image actually took five years to come to fruition. And one of the key points we're gonna talk about today is it may be fast paced and it may be about action photography, but a lot of this takes a lot of time and planning. 
And the more you time, take time to plan and to research things, the better your images will be. Uh, this is Barbaro winning in the most links in current history, actually. And for five years in a row, I asked the Kentucky Derby if I could hang a remote camera at this location. And every year they would say no, unequivocally, it's too dangerous. And so the years go on and finally on that fifth year I said, hey, you know, this year I'd really like to do this, this could be something historic. And they said, fine, but you need a hundred million dollar insurance bond. And I was like, wow, I don't think my, I have a hundred million, I know I have a million. But I was working for ESPN magazine and they said, well, actually we have a $200 million for insurance bond, so you're totally fine. So after all this effort, you know, I'm thinking that there's gonna be this big ceremony, they're gonna walk me up to the roof. And I go in and they said, go meet Joe, and Joe hands me the keys and he says, it's the last door on the left. So it turned out that it was kind of cool because of him winning the most lengths, but um, it's one of those things where a little preparation goes a long way. I'll spend a whole day trying to make one image. This is a 600 millimeter lens with a 2X converter, a Nikkor 600 millimeter lens. And I spent all day figuring out exactly how fast I needed to be to keep their heads sharp, but I wanted movement in the hooves. This is 1 60th of a second with the 1200 millimeter lens. Did I make a lot of pictures that day? No, but I made one picture that I was proud of for my portfolio that hopefully moving forward, not only did I learn something, because as a photographer, you're also kind of like a handyman. The more things you do well, the more pictures you can take. Covered lots of events, as I said, Iron Man Kona, X Games, love shooting the X Games, always looking for angles, textures, doing slow shutter speed, something we'll talk about. Kind of got a weird fear of heights, which is strange for an adventure photographer, specifically man-made heights. This is a, basically about a 100 foot tall scaffolding. And, you know, but you've gotta get the shot. And the only thing I can think of as I'm climbing up the scaffolding is these guys that built it probably didn't get paid enough. And there's probably at least three or four bolts that aren't tightened. And the thing moves about three or four feet in the wind. And, but again, you've gotta get the shot. So you focus in on what you've gotta do and you make the image. High angles, all kinds of photography. I'm not always looking to sell pictures. Some days I just wanna go out and make a good picture because it's food for the soul. It's that thing that propels me into going out and working for clients when they have budgets that allows me to go out and do something a little different. So I photograph all kinds of things. This is ice climbing in Colorado. Aurora, Iceland, one of my favorite places on the planet. We'll see lots of stuff on Iceland. Always looking to start with the background first. I know it's a photo 101 thing, but I start every photo that I take with the background first as being my palette. It's almost like you're a painter. You're starting with the background and then you're introducing the action. Same thing here, Project Bandaloop, Chile, Iguazu Falls. As you can see, just going out Enjoying photography. This is free diving with sharks in Hawaii. Appreciating the process and giving myself an assignment on every given day to come back with interesting images. Love being in helicopters. This is Iceland again. Dynamic landscapes. One of my favorite places on the planet is Iceland looking for textures, shadows, contrast and color, and doing techniques. We can all go out and make a nice image of a waterfall. This is a really simple concept, and I don't know where anybody is in the room as far as their photography, but with a neutral density filter, which means it's a dark piece of glass, in front of the lens, I'm all of a sudden able to do a very long shutter speed, which allows me to get this really beautiful milky kind of look to the waterfall. So this is about a four second exposure, which is super simple. So all of a sudden with one piece of glass that I put in front of my lens, I'm able to go out and produce something interesting, which if I had shot this at 250th of a second, it would have been kind of boring. So always going out and using these techniques to then again, having another technique or another tool in my bag so that when I'm in those positions, I can go out and make good pictures better. I use a lot of technology. 
I do a lot of research. Before I go on a trip, Google Earth, I am looking to see what is out there. We are great, there's a lot of great photographers out there and we are great location scouts. You go on Google Earth and there are thousands of photos. Does that mean I wanna go out and take the same photo? No, but if I can save myself time and effort, it'll allow me to go out and focus on the photography as opposed to trying to find this waterfall that I wanna photograph. So again, a little bit of research, a little time up front makes for better pictures. Uh, I'm also using uh, smartphone apps uh, as well to know what the moon cycles are. So if I wanna do night photography, I know that if I wanna do night photography, I'm not going out when there's a full moon because when the moon is dark, there are better stars. So by doing these things, I'm putting myself in a better position to succeed, as well as those landmarks, which I've done lots of research to go out and find. So whether it's the Statue of Liberty or some waterfall, I can look up on a given day where the sun is gonna rise, where it's gonna set, and at any point in the day, where that sun is gonna be shining on it. So I know that if I go at four o'clock, or seven o'clock in this case, there's gonna be beautiful light on this waterfall. So by putting myself in that good position, I'm gonna make better images. Meteor showers, lots of things you can look up um, as far as things you can do. Uh, this photo transit is great, um, lots of different applications. It will actually show you what a different lens will look like in different locations around the world which is really cool. So I know that if I wanna go photograph the Sydney Bridge, that I can go out with a 25 millimeter, 24 millimeter, 35 millimeter, whatever it may be, and it'll show me the angle of view for that location. I love shooting portraits. It gives me a chance to work with athletes up a little more close and personal because a lot of times I'm covering the action. So I'm going out and interacting with them, using lights and making different kinds of photos. Uh, this is a recent image from Iceland uh, this is my 14th trip to Iceland. And this is the first time that I went actually into the ice caves and it's absolutely magical if you have the opportunity to do it. Uh, found a guide who was also an athlete and went in, figured out my baseline exposure for this area right behind him and then basically had two strobes, SB5000s, filling him and lighting him up so that he's not just a silhouette because as you can see all that light's coming behind him. So going out, making interesting photos, looking for textures, using one light, two lights, doing some composite things. All things that are tricks in the bag, as you will see, uh, to make better pictures. And shooting when the sun goes down. The camera's ISO has gotten so good, just because the sun has gone down doesn't mean we need to put the camera away. This is shot with a Nikon D3, which was the first camera with a high ISO with very clean nose. So I was able to go up to 5,600 and still freeze the action after the sun went down. This image was actually also with the D3, and this image really changed my life as far as being able to do something. Uh, technically, that had never been done before. And what I mean by that is, to get this sunburst, which you'll see here, right here in the middle, Typically you're around F16. This is with the Nikkor 16 millimeter fisheye lens. F16, so very small aperture, not a lot of light coming through. But I also wanna freeze the snow off the top, and this is animated in a, in a software as well, so it's not frozen, you're not seeing things on the screen. But I wanted to freeze this snow, so I wanted to be at 5,000th of a second to freeze that. ISO 5,000, 2,000th of a second, F16. Kind of cool. So going out, using the technology to make something new and different. But just because I have a camera that shoots eight frames a second or 10 frames a second or 12 frames a second doesn't mean that I am going out and using that all the time. I'm always looking for areas of shadow and light and how they play together. The shaft of light that he's coming through, this doesn't need to be at eight frames a second. Again, we start with the background first. We take a test shot, we figure out where we're at and then we have the ski, ski into this area, and we've made a nice picture. So it doesn't take a camera that shoots eight frames a second. Is with a little foresight and thought, you too can go out and make interesting pictures. But it also is great to make pictures when the weather is bad. First of all, there's not a lot of people outside, so those attractions that we all go to see, a lot of times there's a lot less people. But with a splash of color, 
a red jacket or an umbrella or something like that. All of a sudden, we brought this really stark landscape into something unique and different. Again, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Jackson Hole, Wyoming again. Love shooting and skiing. So after college, I moved to Jackson Hole and shot a lot of skiing, but it doesn't snow year round there, so I needed a second sport, and I really fell in love with kayaking. Uh, it was one of those things where the water, the color of the boats, the locations that we were going were absolutely amazing. So I had found my second sport. Going out into the jungles, looking for different things with these guys, going on expeditions, planning these things, not just showing up, again, doing some research, finding some interesting places, making pictures, doing some techniques. This is a composite. This is 12 frames stacked together, show the, the path of the kayak and really just documenting everything on a daily basis. Mexico. Veracruz, Mexico again. And then it happened. This is the second largest waterfall ever run in a kayak. We went back there for multiple years. The levels weren't good. The athletes were, were not into it. And finally it happened. This is Rafa Ortiz, a Red Bull athlete. And through all that perseverance, finally he did it. And then all of a sudden, all that hard work came to fruition. And people ask, well, what is that like? And it's like, you've gone out, and it's like you're working on a house that all of a sudden you've completed. You've made this, this amazing image, which not only is historic, but it's something special because the athlete trusts you. And if you want to go out and take images of athletes, models, and things like that, the first thing you need to get is their trust. Show them that you can take pictures, that you're not gonna let them down when that moment comes, when the big waterfall drops, that you're ready for that moment. And how do we do that? It's like being an athlete, but we have a camera. So we go out and we practice. We practice in harsh conditions. We practice different shutter speeds. We put ourselves essentially in a position to fail to learn what works and what doesn't with our system and how we have a workflow. This is uh, Metlaco Falls, 110 feet. The hardest part about making this image, uh, which this whole beautiful green on both sides over here, is a wall of poison oak, which is like death to me. I am so allergic to poison oak, but adventure photography is like real estate. It's all about location and getting to that spot where you're gonna make the angle and then hopefully you have a little luck and things work out. Um, so I got some gaffer tape, some gloves, and some goggles, and rappelled into this position, and was lucky enough that the sun came out and we made something kind of special. So again, by putting yourself in a good position to succeed, you'll be able to do that. I think a lot about the gear I bring. You have to trust your gear. This is a Nikkor 16 millimeter fish, fish eye lens on a monopod. Basically held it up, got a different angle. This picture has sold hundreds of times. It's generic enough to where it doesn't really say a country or a place. It has a sense of adventure. It's one of those images which, frankly, is kind of cool. It's not the most earth shattering image in the world, but people connect with it. All it took was thinking about finding a different angle and doing something a little different putting yourself in that position to succeed. Again, fisheye lens. Different lens, you wouldn't think typically to shoot in a landscape, but it made this waterfall look really dramatic. By using lenses, whether they be long telephoto lenses or super wide lenses, we can go out and make different pictures which will set ourselves apart from the other photographers who may be going to the same spots that we're going. Mexico. Love Whitewater. Abaco Falls. Mexico jungle. And then we make an image which, to me, is one of my favorite images in my portfolio. And there's no Photoshop here. 99% of these photos that you see are just the way they were taken. This is a naturally occurring uh, soap bubble phenomenon, which basically leaves and bark fall in a stream they get churned up and they make soap bubbles. I was walking back to the car after this assignment 
we're photographing waterfalls upstream. And again, starting with the background first, I look down from the bridge below me and I see these pools of these, this pattern and the guys are floating down from, from doing their, their, their waterfall stuff. I take one test shot for exposure and then three, three frames as he goes through and we made this picture. So again, by starting with the background first, looking for those backgrounds, we've made something unique, something different, hopefully something a little bit timeless. As we progress through our careers, whether it's as a photographer or anything else, we all have areas of discomfort. We have to push ourselves to do something different. For me, early on it was going to India, which I had never been to a country so far away where I spoke no, none of the language and would have to rely solely on interpreters and or other people. So we got to India, we spent 20 days on planes, trains and automobiles trying to get to these locations where people had never seen kayaks before. Along the way documenting things, seeing the daily life, getting about 150 flat tires uh, during the trip. Ironically, there was always a tire uh, fixing station about 100 yards past where we got a flat. So I don't know if the nails were in the road just before you know the tire fixing station, but it's highly suspect. Um, but just going out again and documenting everything. And what I love most about action and adventure photography is that I get to go first for the most part. So this bridge here is made out of 100% natural materials. Bamboo, rocks, and sticks. And they said, oh yeah, we drive over this all the time, totally fine. I said, you know what, I'm gonna get out and I'm gonna take a picture of this because, I don't know, it looks kind of sketchy to me. <laughs> Trekking through the jungle, looking for leading lines, always looking for leading lines, things to draw my, su my subject in. As a photographer, our job is to tell the viewer what we want them to see. How do we do that? By using light and or sharpness to direct our viewer to what we want to see. And by using different focal lengths, we can then show more or show less, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people say that I am known for little person, big landscape, which I guess I could concur. Lots of fun. So on this day, Again, pre-visualizing pre these photos, looking, working from the background first, we're, we see this bridge and I said, oh, this will be awesome. I can go across the bridge, set up as you guys walk across. And again, I'm afraid of heights, so, but you gotta get the shot. And this is, again, one of those bridges, 100% natural materials, so it's just bamboo. And you're like, wow, this bridge looks pretty old and sketchy. And these guys here that are crossing the bridge, they're like maybe 80 pounds soaking wet. I'm kind of a big guy, I'm like, wow, this is kind of scary, going across the bridge, feel like Indiana Jones, it's swaying, whatever, gotta get the shot. Set it up, the light was okay, so I'm thinking, you know, maybe tomorrow we'll come back, we gotta come through here anyway, I'll get some shots with nice light. Come back the next day, the bridge is gone. <laughs> you, see, you see all this stuff down here? These are pieces of the bridge that would have been falling off. So not only like the largest person to probably ever cross the bridge, but on the last day that it was actually um, in operation. So I luckily made it back to show you guys this picture. Crazy stuff. Absolutely beautiful part of India. This is uh, Arunachal Pradesh, which is way northeastern India. Beautiful, beautiful area. This puts it into some perspective how big these bridges are. Crazy stuff. Again, I like to go first. So these are canoes lashed together with what look like two by fours and vines. And then they drive the first car on, backing it up and pulling it forward to, to basically balance it so that it doesn't tip over the, the two canoes that are tied together with twigs basically. And then they pull the other one on and they're like, oh, do you, you can ride in the car, don't worry, you don't have to be outside. I'm like, no, I think I'm gonna go across on the little boat, thanks very much guys. But again, and then another sort of landmark thing, the largest waterfall ever run. Rafa again, my buddy who ran the other waterfall said, hey, I'm gonna run this waterfall. 
And I was like, in my mind, you are going to die. And I was really quite worried about this uh, because I've known Rafa since he was like 18 years old and he's my friend and all I could think was calling his parents and being like, yeah, Rafa didn't make it back. That's gonna be a total bummer. And so my job as a, as, as a teammate basically in these situations is never to push an athlete to do something they don't wanna do. You're a team member. So in this case, I kind of was actually trying to talk him out of it. This is 189 feet. The human body is not meant to go off a 189 foot cliff. So I set up three cameras, three different angles, so that I could document this historic feat. And I actually didn't hold a single camera. Put them all on tripods, fired them wirelessly, because I was worried that when he went over the lip, and oh, by the way, he was only visible here on the lip for about a half second. I've got like five frames of him there, and then he was engulfed in water, gone. So I was worried that I was possibly gonna miss the shot because I was gonna be shaking as my buddy is going off the lip. And if I miss the shot, I'm gonna lose my buddy one way or the other because he's never gonna speak to me again. Because I'm the, doc, I'm the, the, the photographer of record on this, so you don't mess it up. There is no second chance, no like, hey Rafa, do you mind doing that again? So Rafa goes over and um, he comes out, he gets ripped out of his boat, he's got you know, a little, what looks like a mild concussion. And we ask him, you know, what was that like? He's like, it was kind of like being in a washing machine. And I was like, yeah, I could see that. And he's like, and then roll it down a hill. So luckily Rafa made it out okay, um, and he's still out there doing it. So this is kind of the gear that I use, that I take along, a lot of gear. You know, 300 to 8, 70 to 200, 24 to 70, 14 to 24. It's a lot of stuff. Uh, that's my son and my dog. They don't fit in the backpack very well, but uh, they are fun to bring along if, if I have space. So a lot of times I'll use just a little small camera, and these are all just taken with small cameras. You know, the best camera is the one that you will take with you. And I mean a real camera. I don't mean a phone camera because what you can do with a small compact camera is you can zoom, you can change white balance, you can change focus. You know, I'm, not, I'm totally fine with happy snaps, but if you wanna walk away with good pictures that are above and beyond better, a small compact camera will make those pictures because face it, I'm a professional, and sometimes I don't feel like carrying a big DSLR. But I do wanna make pictures because I know I will never forgive myself if I go out and the light is perfect and something happens in front of me. Again, change the white balance. This is 10,000 Kelvin. We'll talk about creative white balance a little bit. Light painting, 15 second exposure, F4, ISO 2000, self timer, click, shutter opens. Basically, spotlight that you can get online. I'm sure they've got spotlights at B&H as well. I'm sure they do. Um, just painting the light, million candle watt spotlight. And if it doesn't look good, Change your exposure, a little longer, a little less. But all of a sudden, driving around, checking out the stars in Jackson Hole, I've made something. Will it sell? I don't care. A lot of this is just to go out and make images that are different, that are unique. Helicopter, sometimes I don't wanna have a big camera flopping around. Going at the peak of fall. Putting yourself in a good position. Again, I mentioned earlier, I like to give myself an assignment. I like to walk away with three pictures in a given scenario. Little macro shot, the little green flower on the, on the compact camera, means you can get up and close. Sunrise shot, another macro shot. All of a sudden, I've walked away with three pictures. Why? I could have been fine with just this picture, which is great, but now I have two supporting pictures because I gave myself an assignment. I held myself accountable to go out and not just make one good picture, but to make at least three pictures. Kawhi, 10,000 Kelvin, macro mode, point and shoot underwater camera, AW100. Just walking down the beach, I see the guy running down the beach. Wow, he's gonna run through the keyhole, kinda cool. If I would've missed this shot, I would've been so angry. This doesn't happen every, every year, and it was a dumb luck that I was there. I usually do lots of research, but this time it worked out. When the weather is bad, 
When it's gray, I like to shoot black and white. It's already monochromatic out there, right? So why not let it go gray? Looking for leading lines, looking for different things. Uh, a few years ago, when the Coolpix AW100 came out, obviously I shoot a lot of kayaking. Nikon called and said, hey, we've got this new little waterproof camera. It's, it's super compact. Do you want it? Would you go do something with it? And I said, sure. So I called Rafa, the crazy kayaker that went off the 189 foot waterfall and the 132 waterfall. I said, what are you doing? He's like, well, we're, we're going to go to Chiapas. And I'm like, isn't that where the, the bandits are? Like the Zapatistas? He's like, yeah, yeah, it should be, we'll be fine though, you know? So everything was going good. And it was one of those days. The water is this beautiful aquamarine. Like this is no Photoshop. And I take this picture and I turned around and there's 20 dudes with machetes. And they are not happy to see me. And I kind of look at my guide and he is white as a ghost and his eyes are this big. And they start yelling at me, Estados Unidos, Estados Unidos. And I'm like, soy de Canada, soy de Canada. And people are like, you're not from Canada. I'm like, no, but I'm, they don't like Americans. Like, I did my research. I did, one of the things I do well is I do my research. So I'm like, no, soy de Canada. So they're like, you know, they're like, really? You know, back and forth. And, and they're like, OK, um, $10,000. I'm like, I don't have $10,000. And like, they're like giving me this like, I'm like, uh-oh, this is getting bad. But I did bring $1,000 in cash, $300 in one pocket, $200 in another, and $500 in another. So first it was like $200, no, 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 $300, no, no, you know. So finally we're up to $1,000. And I give them the money, and finally they're like, OK, leave. So my guide and I, we literally sprint away from this. And the most ironic thing about this whole scenario is that I paid them in US dollars. So I'm not sure if they're up on their currency or what, but it worked out for the most part. So uh, currently live in California. Love, love that area. Um, this is City of Arts and Sciences, Valencia, Spain. Again, by using Google Earth and looking, I was, in, I was doing another job. I was shooting a cycling team down the road. And I said, well, I've got a day off. What am I going to do? Let me see if there's anything cool around. City of Arts and Sciences, one of the coolest architectural installations I've ever seen, 50 kilometers away. Get in a cab, go take some pictures. All of a sudden, with a little bit of work, I've gone out and made some kind of cool pictures for my portfolio or for just fun. Again, these are all just taken with little cameras in this section. This is uh, eight images put together that I uh, shot panoramic and then stitched together with the Coolpix uh, AW1, I think. Could do a lot of cool stuff. Venice, love Venice, love the light. Shoot early and shoot late. I shoot at the best times of day, which is right after sunrise and right before sunset. Um, it's one of those things where the absolute best light, most interesting light is that point. This is on the conveyor belt at Chicago. Is it earth shattering? No, but it was fun. It was something to do. Again, the assignment, three pictures. It was a horrible day out, raining, gray. And I said, I want to make three pictures in 100 yards. So I've got two, three, oh, four, bonus shot, and a panoramic. All of a sudden, I went from a totally unproductive day to a very productive day. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can see, I shoot a lot of surfing now that I live in California. And we're going to talk about a lot of different techniques. Uh, this is with a fisheye lens. Why did I choose this lens? Because I really like the curvature that this offers. Would I use a fisheye lens all the time? No, but in the right situation, it makes for very interesting pictures. Helicopter, 300 millimeter lens. 
looking to isolate the action. Little guy way down there. Different angles, going out when the light's good. Alternative processing. Again, the sky is the limit when it comes to going out and making pictures. There is no right, there is no wrong. There are rules in photography, but they are all meant to be broken. Love documenting all of the things. So, little tip. I shoot surfing and or almost all my sports either really, really fast shutter speed, like one three thousandth of a second or faster, or really, really slow. This is like a 10 second exposure. So again, really fast, really slow. It makes it much more dynamic to make those images really sing. Looking for leading lines near my home in California. Just these, this tree tunnel, I just thought this was interesting. Starting from the background first, we go out, do a test shot, find our background, add the subject. This guy had a bad day. Silhouettes. Silhouettes are a crutch, but I love them. <laughs> But it's one of those things where it can make for an interesting picture and really diversify your portfolio. Um, he's literally standing in the shade of a tree and the, the, the light is obviously very backlit here. Little trick, take that ambient exposure, walk out here and take an exposure for the light with the sky and the sun and the mountains and go down by about a stop, bring your subject back into the shade and you're gonna have a very clean exposure. Fast shutter speeds, 800 millimeter lens. Low angles, looking for those reflections to really capture the sky for the 14 to 24. Again, using all these lenses to really bring you into the this, into this scene. They each have a different feel. And it, it's also great to go out and use one lens if you've got one lens and, and basically hold yourself accountable to use that lens well. Love the helicopter angle. Um, again, 300 millimeter lens with the new Fresnel. Little trick, sunsets, creative white balance. You see this beautiful sort of orangey red tone that we're getting up here? I put the camera on fluorescent. Why would I do that? Because it's going to add magenta because fluorescent light is green. But then you see he's lit, well, he's not red. How did, how did we do that? I've put a green gel over the flash and lit him with that green gel so the magenta that the camera has in all the rest of the scene is red and then he is properly lit. So a little trick. A lot of times 10,000 Kelvin is also great for those sunset shots. Graduated, graduated neutral density filter. Bring down that sky. And then just being there. Going out and making pictures on a daily basis, walking that little extra to find a different angle that may not be the waterfall angle that everybody else has in their portfolio or you've seen on Instagram, but going that little extra distance will make better pictures. Um, I feel like in our current society of social media driven society, that we all have a huge sense of FOMO. When I say FOMO, I mean fear of missing out. Our friends are taking pictures of this. They're out there, they're doing this, they're doing that. And then all of a sudden, we're taking the same pictures. But what we should be doing is going out and trying to make ourselves happy by making images which we actually thought of, spent the time, and even if it is the same waterfall or the same landmark, is it something new, is it something different? Is it star trails behind something iconic that, that you haven't seen before? But thinking through that process and not just copying images that you've seen before, but going out and making those images better. Mavericks. 10,000 Kelvin. So this was a decent sunset, but at 10,000 Kelvin, that's the warmest you can get in the camera. It really makes the sunset pop. It's a crutch. It's a tool, it's a trick, but it makes for a better picture. I'm all about going out and making something unique. 
like the Milky Way. But it, to me, as you've seen, there, there's a, almost a person in every one of my shots. I need to have a person. This picture I actually totally messed up. Forgot the flash at, at home, but I always carry a little flashlight in my bag for these occasions because basically you've got to get back to the car when you're doing night photography. So I did an exposure for the sky, figured it out. ISO 5000, about 15 seconds, and probably F4, I would guess. Had my buddy walk up and put the flashlight right on him so I could focus, because it's pitch black. Get my focus, and then self-timer, shutter opens, and then I just paint the light on him real quick. Three exposures. Made something kind of cool. Again, using what you've got, but having those tools in your bag and readily available so when you're in that position, you're able to do it. This is Kai Lenny, this is at JAWS. Looking for framing elements. I'm always looking for framing elements. Again, starting with that background first. Looking for something to frame the image. Give me some visual variety. <clears throat> doesn't help or doesn't hurt that it's a, a really cool sort of stormy day. Sequences. Just going out, having fun. Shooting at the right time of day. Sunrise, sunset, middle of the day. If I'm on a trip, the middle of the day is usually spent either figuring out what we're gonna do in the evening or finding something like an open market or open shade where we can maximize the day. But otherwise, we're planning on doing things in the evening. <clears throat> Iceland, one of my favorite spots. A lot of this is just being there, putting in the time and the effort to be at that place when the light is nice. This was uh, an image I did for Surfline, which is a big uh, surfing website and it, they've named it one of the most iconic pipeline shots that they've ever run. Because typically, 99.9% .9 of the images you see are from water level or the beach looking right into the barrel at pipeline. That's because it's one of the most beautiful, perfect barrels you've ever seen. But there were also 85 people, because this is one of the best days of the year at pipe, shooting the exact same angle. So we went out. And I said, you know what? If I can budget an hour in a helicopter to go out at sunset, only an hour, we're just gonna go out for sunset and come right back, we'll be able to make something special and unique. And this is what we got. So again, thinking ahead, thinking through the process and not, and avoiding the pack mentality, just because somebody is standing somewhere, I see this, I travel all over the world and I see, I go to a lot of places where you'll see a lot of photographers with tripods. Somebody will move their tripod over say 30 feet and they'll be by themselves. And then all of a sudden, we're kind of like lemmings, right? All of a sudden those guys have all moved over and they're all standing next to that guy. So, you know, don't be afraid to go somewhere different and not be the guy that's saying, you're not missing out. The fear of missing out is a huge hindrance to photography. Don't be afraid about missing something. Go out and l take a step back and possibly even look behind you because there may be an even better picture right behind you. So once every, it happens some years a couple times, some years not at all, uh, Mavericks gets very big. Um, like the other photography, I do a ton of research and I would hope that all of you would go out and whatever your, the type of photography you like to do, whether it's wildflowers or wildlife, uh, nature, et cetera, to go out and put in the time to figure out when the best time is gonna be. Is it the super bloom in California or are the harbor seals mating on the coast? Like, you know, figure out the time that the animals are more, most active. Uh, for me, a lot of that is surf based. So I'm doing a lot of research, figuring out when these big waves are going to be here. Um, so you show up, Mavericks, California. Have you all seen Chasing Mavericks? Crazy movie. Um, you show up and it's, it is like a melee. This, this 
is a very shallow reef and it sounds like a bomb exploding every time it breaks. You can feel the concussion inside your chest. And this thing is big and mean and powerful. Look at the tongue on this thing. It's just absolutely crazy. And these guys are out there on these boards, which are usually nine feet long. They, they're called a gun. And it's a nine foot and it weighs about 80 pounds. So what they're worried about mostly, not only is getting crushed by this, these thousands of pounds of water, but also this 80 pound board possibly hitting them in the head, uh, which would be very bad. Uh, this is uh, Jamie, he broke three boards on the day. You can see how thick these things are, and it was snapped like kindling. Quick little, uh, this is the largest uh, day ever at Jaws. Shane Dorian, Ian Walsh, two of the top uh, surfers in the world. This is Shane with his blow up um, personal flotation device. He pulls the cord. He's testing it out basically uh, to make sure that uh, if he gets off of a wave that he'll be able to, to float to the surface. And this is what the scene looks like. You get there very, very early in the morning. You'll get there about 4 a.m. and you can hear the waves breaking off the shore before you can even see them. And the athletes head down. And again, if there's big waves, there's a lot of people. And this is actually the largest wave ever ridden. They, they measured it about 80 feet. Uh, this is Aaron Gold, absolutely crazy stuff. So again, by doing the research and putting yourself in the right place, all of a sudden you're making historic, meaningful pictures. And it's not that they're not turning out because you've done all your homework. You know how your camera reacts in these situations. You're going out and you're not worrying about camera settings, you're worrying about capturing those moments and those peak moments because these things don't happen again. Kai Lenny. Out riding a monster there. <laughs> kind of cool stuff. You can see this is Shane. He just got rescued after getting demolished by a wave. His uh, PFD is blown up there. And they've got some of the best water safety in the world there. Crazy stuff. So a couple years ago, how am I doing on time, by the way? I, I don't have a counter. Not everybody at once. Good. Okay, cool. Nikon asked me to do, to launch the D810. Anybody gotten to play with the D810? My favorite camera ever. So they said, it's gonna be really cool. It's gonna be high megapixels, lots of detail. And so we went to Iceland, one of my favorite places. Uh, this little super short uh, time lapse was shot with the internal time lapse function, which a lot of the cameras have now, which is really cool because a lot of time lapses take a lot of post processing. And these are spit out as little clips, basically, which then you can just put together with some uh, a background score and make something kind of unique from a trip. Um, from a, something being built in your backyard or whatever it may be. But it's a really cool technique that allows, again, to produce some pretty astonishing content with minimal effort. So a lot of people ask me, what's it like to be on like the, a shoot to launch a new camera? And they're like, well, you, do you just get to go choose what you want to shoot? And I'm like, kind of yes and kind of no. There's, it's, first of all, it's like 87 pages of like a list of things you need to capture. So it's like landscapes, waterfalls, ponies, me. I'm like, well, I got to bring an athlete, right? So bring an athlete, buddy Eric, the surfer. And you go out every morning before sunrise, you hope the waves are good because you've got like a week to produce all this content. Shooting lots of things, fast shutter speeds. So you've seen through the other work, now we're just putting this into play. Sunrise, dynamic range, slow shutter speeds, 
show movement in the water, testing the gear, 24-1-4 at 1-4, tack sharp on the eyes, going through the motions, and just going out and producing content. Finding interesting backgrounds, this is this really cool moss that grows over the lava fields in Iceland. Long exposures. Again, long exposures. Showing the detail of the sensor. Beautiful stuff. And I'm always looking for that moment that makes an image different. Not only is he coming off the top of a wave, but serendipitously there's a bird flying by. What can I do to differentiate myself from the photographer next to me? It's not that I want to be better than them, I just want to be unique and I want to make different pictures than everybody else. So I'm always looking for these subtle nuances, whether it be a body language or gesture or something serendipitous like a bird flying over. And the only way you can do that is to put yourself in that good situation to succeed. So every day, like I said, we got up at sunrise. Well, actually, we leave about 4 a.m. to be there before sunrise. And we get there, it's raining, and then it's snowing, and then the snow's blowing sideways. And then for five minutes, literally five minutes, the sun comes out, he's able to catch a wave, and we've made a really good picture for the day. Would it have been much easier to stay in bed? Have some coffee, sleep in, yes. This is walking back to the car after that shot. The weather came in. So again, nothing ventured, nothing gained. The more you put into photography, the more you will get out of it. And a lot of days you'll get skunked, but by going out there and pushing a little more, trying a little harder, it'll allow you to go out and make not only different pictures, but unique pictures. Um, love to shoot portraits, brought a kayaker as well. This is a super simple concept. I put the camera on tungsten white balance. So you see how blue all this, this area is. So everything that's available light goes very blue. So the little light bulb in the camera. And then I've got one flash with a full uh, CTO gel. CTO is the orange gel that usually comes in your flash kit. And I've zoomed it in and I've lit just, just his face. So everything that the flash is lighting is the right color. Everything it doesn't light is a different color, that really blue color. So nice little technique. So we did the same thing with Joel, our professional kayaker. We went out, started shooting content, but I really wanted to maximize everything. So this is with an 800 millimeter lens and a converter all the way across, and I'm using this on a uh, gimbal. And then I have another camera set up next to me with a 70 to 200, or 300 with a converter doing this because this water is literally flowing off of a glacier. He's like, I can probably do this twice. So again, going out and maximizing those opportunities when they are available. Uh, we hiked around, found some really cool waterfalls. Same thing here, long lens. Uh, this one's handheld. And then I had a second lens, um, or this is the, the one on a tripod and this is the one that's handheld. Same shot, just two cameras. Again, maximizing that opportunity. We had to go to uh, Hawaii directly from there, unfortunately. Uh, we, we needed a few more action shots and the surfing was just too, too windy. So we went out and this is with an 800 millimeter lens as well. Um, came back and this is when the 20 millimeter Nikkor 1.8 came out. So again, Putting those same principles that we've talked about today, finding a background. This is near my home, Pismo Beach, California. This is the sand dunes. So found a background, insert athlete, right time of day, add a little flash. All of a sudden, we've got some pretty cool photos. Uh, one morning, it was super foggy. What do I do? Shoot's not over. We still have to produce content. Go out, produce something in black and white, kind of cool. And then we decided to do something a little bit different. This is uh, steel wool photography. So I'm just gonna say this up front, do not do this in your backyard. I don't wanna be safe. Make sure you do it near nothing flammable. Uh, the principle is very simple. You put steel wool 
and it's quadruple aught, so the four zeros on the steel wool, the, the finest steel wool you can get, put it in an egg beater, like a whisk, you light it on uh, fire with either a nine volt battery, a calculator battery, or a barbecue lighter, and then you spin it around, and so it's a 15 second exposure for this right here, so this is going 15 seconds, and people are like, well, how is he so sharp? Well, all the lights behind him, he's basically just a silhouette at this point. And rear curtain sink, so, or second curtain sink as it's also called, the very last second, flash, boom, lights him up for a split second, and we've got a pretty cool photo. So we did about three of these in about 15 minutes. First thing we do, find a background, figure out how long we want the exposure, find the exposure for the flash, boom, got something kind of cool. We did some star trails. The last thing I was gonna talk about really quick uh, is the new uh, Nikon Key Mission 360, which is kind of a cool thing. Just started putting this into the workflow. Uh, it's a very immersive experience. And it's cool because it's, you can really share a lot of information about you know, your vacation, or even just, you know, um, BTS stuff. I'm gonna start using it for behind the scenes stuff because it'll be very easy to show the whole lighting setup, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of different mounts. Um, I would recommend using the mounts as much as you can because this will give you the most stable shots. Um, there's a lot of different ones. And I'm gonna show you, well here are the first, the three tips and I'm gonna show you a little piece that we did really quick. So, if you're gonna shoot VR, and this is gonna be a super short tutorial, longer shots, and it's not like traditional cinematography where it's like one, two, three, cut, one, two, three, cut. The reason you shoot a longer shot is you wanna give the person, the viewer, and typically VR is, is done either via a headset or with your phone on Facebook uh, or um, YouTube, you can actually like look around in the video. Um, so you want those longer shots to allow the viewer to, to look around within the scene. Um, think about what you want to show first. Is it you as the subject? Because if you're going to be in the frame, if you're holding uh, the VR camera, or is it what you're seeing? So what do you want to show first? Do you want to show yourself first, or do you want to show the environment and the scenery? Um, Use a mini tripod or something to get stable shots uh, that if you don't want to be in, in the shot. And use a lot of the mounts and things to find creative angles. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and show you a real quick piece here that will show you kind of the idea. This is literally four clips. So it's cool, it's, typically you wouldn't be mousing around on this, but you, if you're wearing a headset, you're just looking around at the scenery that he's in, uh, which gives you a total idea of where you are. Um, ideally, the headset is the optimal way to view this, but this is a way to look at it on the actual computer. So as I said before, what do you want to see first? Do we want to see him or do we want to see what he's looking at? And then this would be the opposite here where we're, we're showing what he's seeing. Yes, those are black tip sharks. So something kind of fun, I mean, it's a very immersive tool that took literally about 30 seconds to pull those clips together, put a score to it. Uh, it's something that I'm gonna be incorporating more into my workflow. And uh, you know, it's, it's something that's, that I think is somewhere where we're going. Uh, the VR experience is still, how it's uh, shown is still being kind of hashed out, I guess you could say, uh, but just a closing quote, um, one of my favorite quotes by Walt Disney, all our dreams can come true if we only have the courage to pursue them. So I would hope that all of you, uh, after this truly inspirational weekend of uh, photography, some amazing uh, photos have been shown, go out 
and produce images for yourself. If you want to tag along, there's my social media. I'm happy to answer questions at any point along the journey if you want to reach out.